Hang on. What's going on? All right. Okay. All right. This is our basic sort of form of the differential equation we said. All right. So it's which which one of these is my output? Y or X? Y is the output, right? So X we said was the source. The way I've written this guy here, this is a non-homogeneous equation. What are that? What are so these are these constants, these coefficients are always going to be constant, right? Um what did I also say it's got to be true about all of these coefficients? A n, a n minus one, a one. Well, they they can they can equal zero. In fact, what we what you're going to see in the homework is this term for that for that problem where I have the undamped solution, in other words, where it's just a sinusoidal response, you're going to see that a one better be zero. The first order term represents loss, and so it better it better go to zero. They can never be negative. All right. They can never be negative. So that's that's important. If you're in 2112 and you get coefficients that are negative, you've got a bad differential equation. All right, that you wrote down. All right. So um basically we said with second order stuff, y of t is the output, can be anything, it can be a current or a well, not anything, but a inductor current or a capacitor voltage. Those are the two things that we're solving for always. All right. Equation has that form. Typically, when I say that form, what I mean is that the coefficient on the second order term, the, the second derivative, usually we set that equal to one. Doesn't have to be, right? But normally I could manipulate it, so that's always one. All right, so if I have something in that form, all right, we, I, I gave you kind of the general form of what your answer should be. The, the reality is that your solution always has this form. You got a particular solution and you got a transient solution, all right? You add them together. The process is, is fairly simple, right? You solve the homogeneous equation. Solving the homogeneous equation means what do you do to this thing, to this equation here? Set it equal to zero, right? So I get my transient response. Now, the thing that we do for the second step is to get the particular solution, which we use what I call the, the undetermined coefficient. So in other words, I make a guess, and then I solve for some undetermined values in that guess, right? And then the last piece is to combine them both together, all right? So we're going to do another example today, all right? But we basically said, when I do that, that step here, when I solve the homogeneous equation, I take this guy and I set it equal to zero. And I, and I specifically, I change my Y to Y sub C because that's the part that is the transient response. It's equal to that. And what do I do? I guess that y sub c is equal to what? What's the guess that I make in this case? C, e to the st, right? And what's true about s? Or not s. What's true about c? c is not equal to zero, right? So I plug that whole thing in here. And what I end up with, I think you guys should be able to figure this out. I get this result. Right, C is not zero, E to the ST can never be zero. So basically this whole thing, I solve for what values of S make that equal to zero, okay? This we said, and we're gonna look at this today in some more detail, there's basically four different forms of this thing, right? So if I solve this guy, I get this solution from the quadratic formula, right? So if I have S squared plus BS plus C equals zero, what's S equal to? Tell me that in terms of those coefficients. Yeah, negative B plus or minus what? Yeah, B squared minus 4C all over 2, because my A value here is equal to 1. All right, so what controls what the solution looks like here? B squared minus 4C, all right? So the B term, this middle term, is always going to be the one in the real system that, that controls the losses in the system, all right? That's why I made that point there at the beginning. This B value controls everything. So if I, if I look at the roots, I basically said I have what I call undamped to overdamped. Overdamped is the lossy one, all right? There's a lot of loss in the system, and the roots are purely real. 
And the fact that I wrote sigma one and sigma two here means that not only are they real, but they're real and what? Real and what's the term? Distinct or unique. Yeah, they're, they're different from each other, right? These two guys are the same. I said that one I don't usually care about as much because it doesn't really happen all that often in the real world. The ones that we deal with the most are these two, overdamped and underdamped. Okay. All right. Now we're going to, we're going to go through these examples, but the thing is my transient solution is always C E to the S T plus another C E to the S T. And if I get the case where my roots are complex, notice what happens when my roots are complex. Well, I just combine those into a sine wave. Where did this come from? How did the combination of these two things here become a cosine? What, what do we know that turns this into what's that? Euler's identity, right? Euler's identity is what does that. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> today we're going to do another example. Now we said um, basically we have inputs that are either constants, exponentials, or cosines. All of those are exponentials. So if I have a constant as my input, I guess a constant is my output. If I have an exponential as my input, I guess an exponential is my output. And if I have a sine wave, then I guess a sine wave. All right. And we went through a whole process of saying, all right, how do I deal with sine waves especially? All right. And then basically I summarize here, what do I do to try to get the coefficients that I don't know in that last step? Okay. So it's a fairly straightforward process. And we're going to do another example here today. We did one on Friday. We do another one. All right. So now I've got this guy. All right. So I've told you two initial conditions. I always need two initial conditions, right? Because I'm going to have two unknown values that I'm going to have to solve for. All right. So I said I got three steps. What's my first step in this whole process? Yeah, going to get my transient solution. Okay. So to get my transient solution, what do I have to do to this equation here? Set it equal to zero. All right. So I get d squared y sub c dt squared plus... 9 dy c d t plus 4 y c of t equals 0. All right, so that gives me basically, if I plug in e to the s t, I end up with what? s squared plus what? Oh, I got the, I guess I switched the places. Yeah. 4. And nine. There we go. Okay. So how do I get to my what what equation comes to s squared plus what? 4s plus 9 equals zero. All right. Now I'm gonna solve for that by hand here first, right? So that gives me what? Uh does not. That was the one I did on Friday. Yeah. All right. I got a quadratic formula of this one. I got no choice. What what goes on top here? Negative four plus or minus the square root of four squared minus four times nine over two. Okay. Now <clears throat> I can get that to negative two plus or minus J times the square root of 20 divided by two. All right. Now, looking at that, what form of the solution do I have here? So when I, if I've got my roots are complex, right? When my roots are complex, what, what does that tell me? Underdamped, all right? That part, I mean, we're gonna I'm gonna look at the at the cheat sheet here in a second, but that 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 kind of stuff you probably should kind of know by heart. If I get a complex result, that's the underdamped. If I get a purely real result, what what is that? That's the overdamped, right? All right. So if I if I look at my solutions here, so I, I this is let's look at my my sheet here. So what I'm saying is if I have this case, that's what I have here. Right. If I have this particular case where I have a real part plus a J times, and I call these omega D, right? 
why did I use this omega? Because I know this is going to be the frequency of whatever whatever cosine comes out of this whole process. Okay. So I know right now that my solution is going to have this form. All right. Still two exponentials added to each other. It's just that when I add those two exponentials, it becomes this decaying cosine thing. Okay. All right. Now, before I go on to that, what I wanted to show here is the way that I typically kind of approach this when I'm solving these things with MATLAB. I'll say, all right, S squared plus 4S plus 9 equals 0. I can convert that into, um, so I use this roots command, right? Roots tells me the roots of that polynomial. What I got to give it as is the coefficients in an array. So basically the co the the bottom to the last term in that array is always the zeroth order term, the s to the zero term, right? This guy is always the s to the zero term. Um, if I had a third order thing that I wanted to get the roots of, there would be four terms in here, and the and the s cubed would be the very first one, right? So the s to the zero term is always the last one. We're going to use that more. A lot of a lot of commands in MATLAB kind of do that, where they want you to enter the coefficients of a polynomial in an array like that. Okay. All right. So then I get two values of S here. So if I look at this, this was just what I got on the last page, right? So negative two plus J times the square root of 20 divided by two. And this guy is negative two uh, minus J. Notice these guys are always going to be conjugates of each other. They have to be conjugates of each other to make sure that the, that, that Euler's identity thing is always going to work out. If I don't get conjugates, then something's wrong. All right. Now, um, one thing that I use when I go through this is MATLAB. This is this is a vector here, isn't it? That that s value that that's spit out of here. So, if I wanted to call up those two roots, I would say s of one and s of two. Right. So this guy is s of one. This guy here is S of two. That lets me, you know, manipulate those values. What I'll see you guys do is you'll you'll do this, and then I see you write S one is equal to this. So you'll hard code in S one is equal to this value. S two is equal to this value, right? You can just you can script it, right, and leave them as variables and call them. <clears throat> now the other thing that it would recognize, because this is a what what is this? is this a column vector or a row vector? This S. It's a column vector, right? So S of one and S of two, it'll recognize those, but really I would say that it's first row, first column, and second row, first column. It'll recognize that too, because it assumes that it's a, a matrix, right? So both of those two things will access those variables for me, okay? All right, so that's, that's probably an important step to remember. All right, now, that tells me that my transient response, looking at this thing, right? I have right now that that sigma equals negative two and my omega D value is equal to 2.2361. 2.2361. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write this like this. I'm gonna say Y sub C of T is equal to, how did I write this? C1 plus C2. So I have C1 e to the S1t plus C2 e to the S2t is equal to <clears throat> this whole thing. Now, one thing I know, I, I, without me doing anything, one thing I know is that C1 and C2 are always going to end up being what? Well, in Euler's identity, you, we had this, you know, e to the j theta plus e to the negative j theta a over 2, a over 2, like this. The thing that always ends up happening is that these, these coefficients, whenever it's complex, they're always going to be conjugates of each other, okay? So what I end up with is that c1 e to the s1t plus C2 e to the S2t is always going to be that. Now, I know that, right? I could force you to, to solve it manually, but I, I know that that's the result that's always going to happen. Those two guys are conjugates. 
So what's that mean when I have when I have C1 and C2 that are conjugates, right? What's true about the magnitudes of C1 and C2 that are equal, right? What's true about the angle of C1 and the angle of C2? They're the opposite of each other, right? Those two angles are the opposite of each other. So it means I can write this whole thing as C1 over 2 times e to the j angle c1 <clears throat> times e to the s1t plus magnitude of c1 over 2. What do I do with the angle here? Yep, negative j angle c1 e to the s2t. Like that. Okay. Now that, if I go back to my Euler's identity, right, for this particular type of problem, it's going to end up giving me that that's um, yeah. Sorry, I shouldn't have had the over two there. That's what screwed me up, right? If I had just if I just plugged in what C one was, it's not an over two there, right? It just means that the the result's going to be two times the magnitude of C one. Um, and if I combine this whole thing, because S1 here is a complex thing, this guy just ends up being this. So I end up with that with that result. I, I'm skipping some steps in the math that I it's not hard to prove, but but basically that's what I'm going to end up with. All right. So in this case, my sigma is negative two, and my omega d was the imaginary part of my root, which was 2 point, what did I say? 2.2361, like that, okay? What's always gonna be true about that sigma value? It's always gonna be negative. If it was positive, what's that mean about the, the oscillation here? It's growing and that's that's bad, right? If I have a growing oscillation, what's gonna happen? Yeah, it's going to blow up, right? That's basically implying that the energy stored in the system is headed towards infinity. And the laws of nature just don't allow that, right? So at some point, the capacitor of the inductor is going to blow up, okay? <clears throat> My omega D value better be positive as well, right? That's the other thing. That th that should be positive as well. All right, so th this basically is what I need to do. So I, what I need to do is I'm going to need to solve for C1. I need to figure out what the magnitude of C1 is and the angle of C1. Notice I still have two unknowns. Right, so one unknown is the magnitude, and one is the angle. So I got to solve for those, right? Which we'll get to. Let's do the particular solution. In this case, the particular solution is easy, right? It's that whole equation is equal to one. All right, so with a constant input, what do I guess as y p? A constant, okay? So I always call that b, I guess. So. I have d squared y p d t squared plus four times d y p by d t plus nine times y p of t equals one like that. All right. And then I plug in my y p. So I have basically the second derivative of a constant plus four times the first derivative of a constant. plus <clears throat> nine times a constant equals one. Well, what do we know about the derivatives there for constants? They're zero, both of them. All right, so those are gone. And I basically have that B equals what? One over nine, all right? So I gotta be careful, right? This is really um, for T greater than zero. So my YP of T is either is either that or I say it's one ninth u of t, right? Because I apply it, at, it's only true after t equal to zero because that's when the input's applied to the system is t equal to zero, okay? All right, so the particular solution is easy in this case. What Now, what's my last step? What do I got to do? Still don't know everything. I got to combine them, right? So now, basically, I put the two together. So what I do is I say, all right, I leave it like this. 
All right, so one ninth plus C1 e to the S1t plus C2 e to the S2t. All right, now, because this is second order, I need how many initial conditions? Two, All right? So I, gotta, I need the derivative of this guy, All right? I like the derivative in exponentials because it's a heck of a lot cleaner, right? Than when I have cosines times exponentials and all that. it's ugly stuff, right? What's the derivative of this whole thing? Uh, well, if when I plug in t equal to zero, it is right. So take the derivative of one ninth. That's zero. The derivative of c one e to the s one t becomes s one c one e to the s one t, right? And this guy becomes s two c two e to the s two t like that. All right. Now s one and s two are complex. If I leave it in this form, this is a lot simpler and a lot cleaner to me because I don't need to worry about the fact that they're complex and converting that to cosines. I'm just going to leave it like this, all right, and let those guys be complex. Now, I need an initial condition, which means I need to evaluate this where, what, at what time do I evaluate this thing? Zero, right? Well, that's nice. That means I plug in t equal to zero. So e to the zero is what? One. So this becomes S1 c1 plus s2 c2 all right now the good thing is s1 and s2 these are numbers that i know right c1 and c2 are numbers that i don't know but i'm also given essentially the some some value for the initial condition so i started here the very beginning of the problem i told you that the initial value of the output is three and the initial value of the derivative is zero. So I've got initial conditions here. All right, so for, for this guy, I've got that this is equal to zero and y of zero, I said was equal to, what did I say it was, three? Yeah, three. Y of zero is three. I plug that I plug t equal to zero into into this expression here, right? What happens to that when I plug in t equal to zero into that? Yeah, one ninth plus c one plus c two. What I can see here pretty clearly is I've got two equations with two unknowns, right? That's MATLAB's perfect for that. I can say I've got y of zero, dy of zero by dt minus one ninth. I put those into a column vector. And then I have one, one, sorry, one ninth in the wrong spot. Minus one ninth, one, one, S1, S2, C1, C2, like that. Right. So if I so what did I do? Let's look at the bottom the bottom equation here. Right. I'm saying this this guy, which is a number that I know, is equal to s one times c one plus s two times c two. Right. If I took this equation here, y of zero minus one ninth, that's here, is equal to c one plus c two. Okay. So I've turned that into a system of equations that I'm going to use MATLAB to solve for me. So I can put all this into there fairly easily, all right? So I end up with, <clears throat> when I plug in the initial conditions, right? I ended up with um, one ninth plus C1 plus C2. And this guy was equal to S1 C1 plus S2 C2. So I put those together into this system of equations. So what? here's how I set this up when I go into, into MATLAB, all right? <clears throat> I set this up as, let me write it this way. One, one, S1, S2, C1, C2. <clears throat> I keep this as variable. So I, I, I write Y zero minus one ninth and I have y prime underscore zero 
right? So I called this, I, I defined a variable called y underscore zero to be my initial condition. And I defined another variable called y underscore prime underscore zero to be my initial condition for the derivative. And I put those together into one thing. And I, I called this guy A times C equals little b. So what I did was I defined this system of equations right here. All right. So just to understand what I've got here, y underscore zero minus one ninth semicolon y prime underscore zero minus zero. What the heck am I saying there? What's the semicolon do? Makes a new row, right? So basically what I'm doing is I'm trying to create that column vector right there, okay? Then what I did is I made this A vector. So notice what I did, one, one, semicolon. Semicolon goes to a new row. And I did S of one and S of two. So notice I didn't bother you know, writing, hard coding in what those numbers are. I basically pulled it right out of that roots function, right? And just substituted them right in there. And then to solve it, I used, I just said the C values are the inverse of A times B. All right. So in other words, if, if B equals A times C, I said C equals A inverse times B, All right? That's me writing that out there. Notice the two values of C, which, so here's C. So that's a column vector, right? Looking at this, C1 is this guy. C2 is this guy, right? What that tells you is the this root goes with the S1 value. This, this guy here goes with the S2 value, right? They're paired together now. What do I notice about C1 and C2 right there? Conjugates, right? So when I so here I go and I take the magnitude and I take their angle, right? So when I take their magnitude, I see they have the same magnitude, and their angles are opposite of each other. Okay. Now with what I've got right here, I just solved for those two values. And we said a couple of slides ago, as I said, y sub c is equal to two times the magnitude of c one e to the sigma t cosine omega d t plus the angle of c1. I now know what that is, right? How do, what is that going to be based on this? Two times what? One point, yeah, 1.9379. Sigma was negative two. Um, omega d, 2.2361. 2.2361 T. What's the angle of C1 here? Based on what I have here, what's going to be the angle of C1? So I said, so maybe it's hard for you to tell you. So I, I don't have, so what I did was I pasted what came out of the, the editor. So I, so I don't have a semicolon here. I don't have a semicolon here. So I need to output these to the screen. So it's confusing maybe because it says ants equals, right? But looking at this, I had it tell me C, then I had it tell me this, then I had it tell me this. All right. So this, the, here's the angle. What's the angle of C1? Negative 41. Yeah, so it's negative 41.8103 degrees, like that. So at this point, I got everything, right? And I can put it all together, right? So in your in your homework, what you have... I think I ask you for for y underscore c underscore amp. I don't know. That seems awfully complicated when I write it that way, but it's basically two times this the c one. It tells you what is the amplitude of of this decaying cosine. So this is what it is. This is the amplitude of that. And it asks you, I think, for phi sub c. All right, those are the two values that it's looking for when you go in to to put your stuff together in the solutions. All right, now. <clears throat> Here's what I end up with. I ask you to, to make all three of these, right? So what are my plots that I have here? I've got three plots. Which ones are which? What's the blue one? Right, this is my YP. Now, how did I make that? Here it is right here, right? Well, I'm using that ones command again, right? So what's ones gonna do? I say one size T, what's it gonna do? 
Yeah, it's going to make a vector of ones that has the same size as the time vector, right? So, all right, and I multiplied it by one ninth to make sure that it, instead of getting a vector of ones, I get a vector of one ninth, okay? All right, then notice what I'm doing here to get y sub c, right? I do two times the magnitude of c times the exponential of the real part of s1 times t. What did I do here? Real part of S1 times T. What's the real part of S1? It's negative two, right? It's that sigma value like that. So I just use the real command to extract that. And here, for whatever reason, I created a variable omega D, but omega D, that variable omega D how could I have gotten that from S1? Yeah, I would have said it was the imaginary part of S1, like that, right? That would have extracted it for me, okay? And then I've got all my code here. What is this thing right here? Element-wise operation, right? Basically because I want every element in the exponential vector to multiply with every corresponding element in the cosine vector. All right, that's a really important step. If you do that wrong, you'll be there for a while while your computer goes to compute, okay? All right, so looking at these then, all right, which one, the red and the yellow, which one's the, the just the transient solution by itself, the red or the yellow? The red, how do you know that? Because it goes to zero. Transient response always goes to zero, or does it? Seems like it should. It does if there's loss in the system, right? The one thing that's going to be that's going to happen is if I look at the undamped, in other words, if those roots come out to be purely imaginary, which can only happen if there's no B term, right? Does that that becomes my transient response? Still two exponentials. Those two exponentials combine to a cosine that does not decay. So what's going to happen to that guy? Is that transient response going to go away? No. That transient response doesn't go away. That's weird, but you can make it happen. I give you a circuit there in problem four, which will do that. That circuit uses something called a transistor, all right, which is the term you guys have heard of. You don't have to worry about that. All right. What I give you is a model for it. I basically say there's a there's a capacitor, an inductor, and a dependent source. All right. A dependent source, you probably asked yourself before, what the heck is a dependent source? Right? Can I go to Amazon.com and can I buy a dependent source? No, you can't, right? You can buy a, you can buy an independent source, right? I can buy a battery, right? But I can't buy a dependent source, but you can make one with something like that transistor, okay? All right, now, um, that's, you know, for, for second order, I think you guys, have, you guys have seen differential equations. I don't want to, to go through this much more than this, right? Basically, I think you guys have a good understanding of, of this stuff, or you should by now, all right? So, um, I'm not going to do an example of a critically damped or whatever. I think you guys should be able to understand that. So we did an overdamp the other day. We did an underdamp today. Critically damped would be the other case. I think you should be able to figure it out. It just follows the same same basic process. In fact, you've probably done some with Yahoo. All right. What we're going to start on Wednesday is basically saying, okay, if I was a computer, all right, the computer would not solve it like this, where it guesses something of a particular form, right? You actually solve the differential equation numerically and say, okay, well, here's what Y is going to look like point by point. All right, that's what we're going to kind of pick up with on Wednesday.